on October the 22nd, 1707, there occurred one of the greatest disasters in British naval history, when the flagship association and three other warships ran aground on rocks off the Scilly Isles. The disaster was the result of a navigational error by the commander of the fleet, Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel, and in all, nearly 2,000 men, including Admiral Shovel himself, lost their lives. The problem of navigating safely was caused because there was no reliable method of determining a ship's position when out of sight of land. This was due to the inability of the navigator to determine his longitude, and the Scilly's disaster spurred the government of the day to pass an act in 1714 offering a fabulous prize of £20,000 to anyone who could come up with a reliable method of accurately determining longitude at sea. In 1530, the Flemish astronomer Gemma Frisius had suggested that a clock might be used to help determine longitude, but no clock had been made that would keep time accurately enough or even operate reliably on a sea voyage. That problem was to be solved by a lone genius, a humble village carpenter from the wilds of remotest Lincolnshire. His name was John Harrison. Harrison was a native of Yorkshire, but had moved with his family to live in Lincolnshire when just a child. An accomplished carpenter, he developed an interest in clockmaking and is believed to have made his first clock around the year 1713. Although displaying no remarkable technical innovations, Harrison's early clocks were unusual because their movements were made almost entirely of wood, a material with which he was, of course, very familiar. Wooden clock movements were to be manufactured commonly in the 19th century in both Germany and America, but Harrison was possibly the first person to ever build such a clock. It isn't known exactly how many wooden movement domestic clocks Harrison produced, but in the early 1720s he received a commission from Sir Charles Pelham to build a turret clock for the stable block at his Lincolnshire home, Brocklesby Park. Harrison realised that the conditions under which such a clock would be required to operate would be much harsher than those of a domestic environment, so he introduced innovations to help make the clock as trouble-free as possible. Wood continued as the main constructional material for the clock, but iron and steel were eliminated in favour of brass which would resist corrosion in the damp conditions. To eliminate the need for lubrication, Harrison arranged to run his brass arbor pivots in bushes of lignum vitae, a naturally greasy tropical hardwood, and so eliminating lubrication at this point. Initially, the conventional anchor escapement of the clock required lubrication. But this soon gave trouble, and Harrison turned his mind to inventing a solution. He came up with the grasshopper escapement, which will be described in more detail later on. No one knows for certain when Harrison first heard of the Longitude Prize, but when he did, he embarked on some remarkable experimental work to try and improve the accuracy of land-based clocks, with a view to transferring such improvements as he could make to a timekeeper that would hopefully perform reliably at sea. Between the years 1725 and 1730, John Harrison, along with his brother James, produced a remarkable series of at least four long case clocks, whose movements were virtually miniaturised versions of the Brocklesby Park clock but which contained even more innovations. The clock illustrated here was retained for many years by Harrison's family, 
but is now displayed in the Clockmakers Company Museum in London. The early history of this second example is not known, but it was discovered many years ago in a derelict state in the cellar of a public house in Hull. Purchased and restored by the late Colonel Humphrey Quill, the first man to compile a detailed biography of Harrison, it later passed to the Time Museum at Rockford, Illinois, but is now back with an English collector. Little is known about the history of this third example, but it was bequeathed some years ago to the collection of Leeds City Museums and has recently been conserved, ready to go on public display. This final example now exists as a movement only and can also be seen on display in the Clockmakers Company Museum in London. So what made these clocks so special? With the help of a full-size replica, we will now attempt to show you. <laughs>